Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we are stepping aside for, a, uh, for at least uh, this week uh, from our uh, series on the Gospel of Mark because, interestingly, the Gospel of Mark does not contain the triumphal entry. It's not there. Um, and that is, of course, not because Mark is inaccurate or incomplete, but rather that this was just not one of the stories that God particularly laid on Mark's heart to include in his gospel. And so instead we have it recorded elsewhere. In this particular instance, we are going to look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, the beginning of Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, to look at the triumphal entry. And I am going to, I know the screen is in the 2011 version of the NIV. The Pew Bibles are in the 1984 version of the NIV, and I'm going to read to you from the English Standard Version. Uh, my, my daughter really likes the English Standard Version, but that's not why I'm choosing it, uh, because I think it's a pain in the butt sometimes, to be honest, the English Standard Version. It's a little awkward in its phrasing, but that being said, there is a particular thing in here that we need to talk about because it is important to the Gospel of Matthew, and it shows up in the English Standard Version, but doesn't really show up in the New International Version. So, uh, we are going to read, uh, you're going to hear something different than you see, uh, no matter what, unless you have an English Standard Version Bible with you. So, this is the story of the triumphal entry. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now, there are some contextual things that you need to understand about the, the times in which Jesus lived. And some of you will no doubt know this. I know Mrs. V teaches uh, all about Roman culture and about the times in which Jesus lived and, and following with the early church and so on. Uh, so she's got this nailed and probably a lot of you do also. But one of the key things to remember in the Roman Empire is that the idea of the triumphal entry was a well-known theme or, or uh, motif in that culture. Often, when you're looking at the, the capital, when you're looking at Rome, what would happen is that the, the victorious general who had led the armies in conquest of new territory for the Roman people would come into Rome, returning from his triumphant, uh, from his victories, and there would be huge parades and crowds would be shouting out about how wonderful this general was and so on. And then the emperor, uh, depending on the emperor and depending on the situation, would receive that general and put on them the laurel leaf crown and, and applaud them for their great 
uh, victories and so on and so forth. Now, of course, part of the danger with that is that the, the general, and this is something that especially later Roman Empire emperors realized, that the popular, um, the conquering hero who returns into Rome always has the opportunity to perhaps crown himself emperor and take over by force the empire. And, and this is a dangerous thing. And so not only do we have the motif of the triumphal entry, the general returning from conquest into great celebration and laud and honor and so on, but we also have the danger for the ruling class associated with that. And that's all part of the well-known context of what Jesus and his disciples know and see. Now, in this particular case, a lot of theologians and Bible scholars believe that probably the majority of the folks who were in the crowd that were giving Jesus this triumphal entry, probably a lot of him, a lot of them came with Jesus and had been following Jesus all the way from Nazareth in the north. And they, they came and they provided this triumphal entry. This is probably a, a large portion of the crowd. That's why in Matthew, the, the city, the people of the city say, who is this? In verse 10, right? And the crowds said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The crowd that gives Jesus the triumphal entry knows who he is. He has, in a sense, conquered Nazareth. And he has conquered Galilee. And they are providing him with that triumphal entry so that hopefully he may conquer Jerusalem as well. But we need to remember then, too, that the Pharisees and the religious leaders who in the Gospel of Mark we see a number of times send spies up to Nazareth and Galilee to check out what Jesus is doing. Those same people are the religious ruling class in Jerusalem, too. And so they're seeing the triumphal general come in and they are afraid for their own power. Now, we need to note a couple of other things. Uh, and you may remember this or you may not because I don't remember everything that my pastor says in a sermon and I'm the pastor. So that's embarrassing sometimes. Anyways, uh, one of the things we need to highlight is that Jesus calls the disciples to go ahead and get uh, the donkey and the foal of a donkey, right? Now, Matthew is very, very, very focused on proving to Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who was prophesied before. And so over and over and over again throughout the Gospel of Matthew, you will hear Matthew say something like, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Verse 4, you can see that in this case, right? So the prophet said, uh, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, because Matthew is trying to make sure, really, really sure, that people understand that Jesus is the Messiah, he engages perhaps in a little bit of exaggeration. It's not, it's not not true. It's, as they would say in English terms, hyperbole, right? A little bit of an exaggeration. And please don't think that I am, uh, I am saying that the Bible is not accurate because it is. But this is important too. 
The disciples, verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Okay? Jesus probably, I think it would be pretty difficult, Jesus probably did not sit on both donkeys at once. In fact, in other Gospels, we hear about how Jesus sits on a donkey, right? But that's not Matthew's point, right? Matthew is not overly concerned with actually how many donkeys Jesus sat on. Matthew is instead concerned with pointing out, no, really, 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 Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Seriously. Right? Don't ever doubt it. So if the prophecy includes two donkeys, then Matthew's going to include two donkeys. Not that it's not true. There were two donkeys. But he exaggerates a little bit, perhaps, to make the point. See, this is one of the things that we always must remember about the Bible. The Bible is true. Capital T, capital R, capital U, capital E. True. But our perceptions of what true is are a little bit skewed, a little bit messed up. When we think of true, we often think of history books that try and record all of the facts. Okay? But that's not the arbiter of true. That's not what true is necessarily. See, poetry is also true. Good poetry, that is. Right? Fiction is also true. All kinds of stories are true in bigger ways than a history book. Now, it is obviously very true that Jesus came in on the donkey. It is very true that Jesus came in with this triumphal entry. It is very true that all of this happened to fulfill what had been called on before by the prophet. This is all true. And Matthew wants to emphasize that. Why does Matthew want to emphasize how true all of this is? Because the triumphal entry matters. It matters. And why does it matter? It obviously does not matter in the same way that the people who are celebrating Jesus think it matters because they were hoping for, along with the disciples, they were hoping for a, a, a real concrete conquest of Jerusalem and Israel and perhaps even conquering the world. But regardless, at very least liberating the people of Israel from under the thumb of the Roman Empire. That's what they longed for. That's what they hoped for. That's what they had experienced for a brief little while during the time of the Maccabees. That's what they were looking for again. And indeed, there was a revolution or an uprising a little bit later in around AD 70, where uh, the Romans came in and absolutely crushed them and destroyed the temple and so on. But they longed to be free from under the Roman occupation. But that's obviously not what Jesus did. Jesus did not come in and conquer. But instead, he came in and conquered an enemy far bigger. And this is the reality. Here is an important thing. The word Hosanna. If we look in chapter, uh, or in this chapter, sorry, in verse uh, 9. 
Where is verse 9? And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we, we often think that Hosanna is like kind of the same word as hallelujah. It's kind of the same word as praise the Lord. It's the same word, but it's not. It's actually a word that means help. It means save us. And so the crowd was saying, in effect, to Jesus, the conquering general from the north, save us, help us. And Jesus knew that their words went actually far deeper than the Romans who were occupying them, but that they really needed saving from Satan and death and sin itself. And so they cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus heard them and knew that their cry for help was deeper than they themselves could know. And then we look back at Psalm 22 that we read for our confession and assurance about the cry that the people, that the psalmist had, the cry of desperation, the cry that was echoed by the people of Israel, the cry that has been echoed by humanity throughout the ages ever since Adam and Eve. And Jesus answers that cry. So what is Palm Sunday all about? Palm Sunday is all about celebrating God and His victories past, present, and future. The people who celebrated Jesus coming in were not wrong. They were right in the sense that Jesus had spiritually conquered the north part of Israel. And they were not wrong. Jesus was going to conquer sin and death and Satan. And the psalmist was not wrong that, Jesus, that God had delivered the people of Israel time and time and time again. And the psalmist was not wrong to cry out for God's salvation right then either. Because he knew his faithful Savior. And we too are not wrong to say, Hosanna, save us. Praise to you, O God. Because God has delivered us. And God is delivering us. And God will come again triumphantly upon the clouds to finally make all things right and good. The people of the triumphal entry did not know fully what they were praising God for or even what they were ask, asking for help for. We don't either. But we do know, just like they did, that God is our deliverer. Always. Past, present, and future. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your son, Jesus Christ, and for his triumphal entry. It seems from a human perspective to be such an odd and tragic way for this last week of Jesus' earthly life to begin. For Jesus to come into Jerusalem with a triumphal entry only less than a week later to be crucified as a criminal. But, oh God, we see 
we see because of your Holy Spirit, because of your scriptures, because of the testimony of Matthew, because of the truth of your word, we see that your deliverance is sure and strong and true. Yesterday, today, and forever. O oh God, let us take comfort in the remembrance of your deliverances in the past. And let us take comfort in the reality that you are delivering us even now. And let us, O oh God, look forward to the day when you will restore and renew and reconcile all things to you, O oh God. In a new creation. May we. Carry that hope and triumph with us. In your name. And for your glory alone. Amen.